Okay, here we are. It's Wednesday, 3 o'clock, and guess what? It's the economy and you, and guess what? That's Chris Leatham. This is his show. But I am a reciprocating host today. My name is Jay Fidel. I like Chris, and I like the economy and you. And uh, today we're going to talk about his favorite thing, which is computer programming. Welcome to your own show, Chris. Well, thank you, Jay. Thank you for having on my own show. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that we talked about was, um, you know, this is Think Tech, right? So it's about technology. Tech is our middle name. Tech is our, that's right. So if we're going to talk about technology, you know, one of the things that we talk about and what we can be doing to grow our economy is bring in more technology. So I thought, well, you know, one of the, the topics of technology is moving away from spreadsheets, the sort of traditional flat file databases that people so often use. And I've seen them throughout being oh, used yeah, ubiquitously. It's, it's, the, it's the coin of the realm for most businesses. Yes. Because it's visible, right in front of you, uh -huh. easy to use, yeah. relatively speaking. Well, it's WYSIWYG, right? What you see is what you get. Yeah. Now, the thing is, the problem with database or, or spreadsheets as a database is they're flat file. They don't, they're not, they sort of run out of efficiency at some point. So, you know, you don't get to store, you store data in a flat file structure, and eventually what happens is it no longer works efficiently for you. Yeah, you've got to duplicate the data in various flat files. Yes. And that's why we're calling this show Relational Databases Are the Best. That's right, because we all know we all love our relations. <laughs> <laughs> well, databases love their relations. That's right. One big happy family. Yeah, well, it's an imperative. So when we talk about database design, you know, um, a lot of people go, well, what's the difference? Like in Microsoft uh, Office, in the Microsoft Office suite, there's a program called Microsoft Access. Microsoft Access is a desktop database platform, much like your favorite database program, which is FileMaker Pro. Well, actually, I get to give you my history on this. Oh, okay. I started out with something called DBase uh, 2, and PS, there was no DBase 1. It was a gag. <laughs> That's right. And then it was DBase 3. three and then? then? Well, I, I never got to 4. Yeah, there was four. a 4. Okay, then yeah. I went to Clipper. Clipper was a compiled language instead of an interpreted language. Mm -hmm. This is in the 80s. And Clipper really opened it up for me. But then I saw ASP.NET, Microsoft. And Microsoft used SQL, you know, so it was yes. ASP.NET running the SQL, uh, you know, search language. And that was really something. Um, <clears throat> so I started getting into that. And I wrote a lot of programs using that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for some years anyway. Um, and I'm familiar with Access because Access is kind of, uh, you know, the younger brother, if you will, uh, of all that stuff with, um, with uh, ASP.NET and, yes. and SQL. Yes. Um, and I forget, there was another database language in there, the framework thing. Uh, do you remember? No. Well, within the, within today, what we have is a language called Link, which is language no, integrated query. Anyway, no. so yeah. I mean, at the end of my story is, uh, uh, for a lot of reasons, I got out of that back in the early 90s, uh -huh. maybe the middle 90s, and uh, I do remember how powerful it is, and I do remember that relational databases were all the rage, um, and I do remember that Access was their flagship, what do you want to call it? It's really consumer level because it's, you, it's drag and drop, you can make it happen. That's right. Drag and drop. That's right. Um, and you've been programming in that, so this is very valuable to discuss exactly what is the condition, you know, in terms of public acceptance, professional acceptance of the Microsoft Access program today. And P.S., Microsoft's stock has doubled in the past couple of months, so there must be something good happening there. Well, the, the thing is, is that when, when people started talking about um, um, how to improve sort of track data. The spreadsheet only got you so far. And I started working with Microsoft Access, well, interestingly, like, while, while I was living in Indonesia. Uh, we had started an investment company called Pacific Financial Services, and we needed a way to get people their monthly reports. Well, we were using Excel spreadsheets initially, which meant the girls who were doing the data entry had to enter in all the data for every client, for every security they had, and it took them days to do this work. So by setting up an access database, we could then plug in the values of the, the stocks that they held in the portfolio and generate the reports, and it took minutes instead of hours. It was, it was an amazing improvement in the, in the ability for us to get work accomplished. Yeah, but you haven't put in the time to program it. Because right. you didn't have spent any time at all with a spreadsheet. It was right there, WYSIWYG. Yes, except, of course, then you had to key in all that data over and over and over again, which, of course, became a And it could challenge. be different the second or third or fourth time. That's the problem, yes. that it wasn't accurate. You know, it depended on somebody carefully, 
in, in inputting it the right way each time. Each time. And so by, by developing a database application where we could track the history of a stock price and then identifying a purchase, a sale, you know, when this purchase, the stock was purchased and the stock was sold, we could then, it was easy for us to figure out how much money the client made uh, in net gains or losses on that stock. Mm -hmm. Much, much less work. Mm -hmm. um, and so because we, we could download that information into the database and then simply apply our client's trades. You could suck it up from the, from the spreadsheet into Access. Yes. And that's really powerful to be able to do that. Yeah. And then you have to re-enter it again, yet again. Yeah. yeah, and then you remove that redundant data entry process, which yeah. is, of course, um, one of the things that I still see uh, in government offices today, where you'll see somebody come in and they'll enter in the data off of a, off of a document, enter it, and then turn around, reach over to another computer and rekey in the same data all over again into another system. Yeah. So these are some of the challenges that we face when we're trying to develop efficient data models and efficient processes. So why, why a database? So why a relational database? Well, um, it, it allows you to what logically is it, way, relate. I hate to ask, but what is a relational database? A relational database is a, a, a collection device uh, that, that allows you to collect logically related data. That's what a relational database is. So um, you can store data in, in two-dimensional tables that look like spreadsheets, except instead of having columns and rows, you have records and fields. Now, um, now the thing is, is, is when you have a table which looks like a spreadsheet, the columns in a table have specific data types. Okay, so one of the key things that you look at is what's the nature of the data? Spreadsheets just look at it as, okay, I put something in, it's there. Okay? Usually numbers. Numbers. <laughs> um, but in a relational database, um, you're going to store data based on its data type. Simply, if it's a what, date... Give me an example of a well, data type. For example, a date. Okay, a date or a time. That would be a date time so data type. That field in that data table yeah. is only for either text or a date, or some kind of structured type for data. Yeah, so you could have um, text fields, which store you know things like our names. Um, you could have text fields that also store things like numbers that aren't calculated values, such as our social security number. That's really the Those same thing as Those are databases all field. over. It's just a text field. It's just a text field, yeah. right, yeah. Now, you can store numbers. You can store all kinds of numbers. You can store very large numbers and very small numbers in databases. And you can have numbers that are real numbers or integers or, or fractional numbers or decimal point numbers, uh, currency values. All these things sort of fall under the category of number because they're numbers means that you could perform addition, subtraction, multiplication, yeah. and so on. So you were getting to the point of trying to tell me about the relations between the tables right. in a database which has related tables. Well, of, yeah, and then the way that works is you have something called a key. So one of the keys that databases use um, by our government to keep track of us as taxpayers is our social security number or our taxpayer ID number. That becomes a key. And any data that, that correlates or, uh, to us as an individual can get stored in separate tables uh, based on that key. Well, there's a parent and a child here, right? There's a parent Which child. one is the parent? Which one is the child? Well, the primary, we call, well, you might call it a primary or foreign. You have primary, primary or foreign, uh, same foreign thing. keys, right? Primary exactly. is the parent, That's foreign right. is the child. Right? For, foreign is the child. Child, right. So um, when you have. For example, when you go to the store and you buy something, and this is sort of a common uh, analogy of why we use relational databases and how stores use databases, is that when you go in to shop for something and you, you have 10 items, okay? So you come in, you're the, the customer, and then you have the 10 items that you're purchasing, okay? But you also had a transaction. So the transaction of purchasing 10 items, that gets stored in a relational table and you as the individual get stored into that table as the child or the foreign key. In other words, let's say, for example, your social security number, they've got, or they've got an identifier number for you in the system. Every time you come into the store and you buy new goods, um, it tracks the so, transactions. So you have the sort of the invoice then? Yeah, the that's, invoice. That's the, that's the master here. That's right, the, right. the parent, uh, the parent with, the, with the key. Right. And then you have two children you're describing, two foreign keys. One, one is the, the products, right? The various products that can mm -hmm. go into the invoice, so right. to speak. And the other 
is me as a customer. Right. I so have, have to be linked to the invoice. That's right. So what you have is you have you, you have the, the transaction, and then you have the individual items within the transaction. Each table has its own unique primary key or, for, or primary key, um, but the individual, for example, you as a transaction would be stored in the transaction table, but then that transaction also has its unique identifier. And usually these numbers in most databases today are sequential. So okay, there's a so sequential number assigned to that new I record. got it. So like graphically, you can see this stuff graphically, right? Yes. You can, you can actually you have to establish it graphically. If you're using Access, they give you these um, mm -hmm. graphical representations of the tables and all the fields. Yes. And then you, you know, physically go from one table to another table and, you know, draw your mouse to in order, in order to make a line between the one and the other, sort of connect them up. Yeah. Well, when you're designing data tables, when you're designing, now here's the thing about when you when you talk right and the reason that this is an imperative is because when you build a database you're building it based on your business model however it is that you do business okay so for example if you are a company that makes surfboards okay town and country surf is an example of a company that makes surfboards okay there's certain information that they need to track for example if there's a custom board being designed for a customer, you know, for a, for a new customer, a uh, surfer who wants specific features in his board, well, all that comes into the order. Okay. Now, what happens is, is you have different people working on different parts of that order. So, as that surfboard moves from one end, one part of the the factory to another part of the factory, you need a way to effectively keep track of who did what how much you're paying him to do the work, because you may have negotiated different rates with different people, and then where the, the board is in the, in the manufacturing okay, so process. So the board, the, the board as it moves through, yes. that's the, you know, building the board parent, so to speak. Right. And then the foreign keys, the children, are all the people out there and the things they're doing. So you could have a bunch of children and only the one parent, which is the board moving down the assembly line. That's right, that's right. So, and, and, and but I agree is, with you, yes. it's like different, you have to look at the business process in that company, in that enterprise, yes. in order to understand, first you have to understand the relationships, exactly what is happening. And that's a mind blower, so much so, that we're gonna take a break so we can you know, relax our minds for just <laughs> one second yes. and get off the hot seat over here, and then we'll come back, we'll be refreshed. That's Chris Leatham. The economy and you, talking about relational databases, they, they are the best. <laughs> I'll be right back. Aloha, this is Reg Baker with Business in Hawaii. We're a show that broadcasts every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We would love to hear from you, and you can reach us in several different ways. We have a hotline that you can call in at 415-871-2474, or you can email us at thinktechhawaii.com or you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI. Looking forward to hearing from you and seeing you on our next show. Aloha. Hey everybody, my name is David Chang and I am a new host for the show, The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to share with you how to get the smart edge in life. We're gonna have awesome guests in the military, business, political, nonprofit world. So no matter what background you're from, we have something for you. Please join us every other Thursday at 10 a.m. at thinktechhawaii.com or on theartofthinkingsmart.com. I look forward to seeing you. Aloha, everyone. I'm Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. Um, we are here to show you news, issues, and events local and around the world. Join me. This is Steve Katz. I'm a marriage and family therapist, and I do shrink wrap, which is now going to every other week, all during the summer and maybe forever after. Take care of your mental health this summer. Have a good time. Do what's fun and take good care of yourself. Bye-bye. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September, and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer, and tune in at noon every Tuesday. 
Okay, so when I do this, it means that I don't have, when I do relational tables, it means that I don't have to enter the data, you know, multiple times. That's right. Because so the it, parent yeah. will find it in the child table. That's right, that's right. So when you want to generate, so the, why, why go through all this headache of designing a database in the first place? So you have your primary key and you have your foreign keys. Why is this, the, the thing is, is why do people, if you're in business, why do you want to build a database to track all this data? Well, if you're the ABC store, for example, um, and you want to know which products are selling, which products are selling at what price point, say if you have different prices going on in different stores, you know at what price point you're going to get the most sales. So you're able to track all that information in your database. And writing reports against your data is one of the key benefits of using a database platform. So, so if you have relational tables, yes. then the language that you use to extract that information, to make those reports, to answer all your questions, would mm -hmm. be, in the Microsoft world, it would be SQL. SQL, Structured Query Language. Yeah, now that really is powerful stuff. That's been around a long time, and it's the coin of the realm, isn't it? It is, it is. And you know, here's the thing. When people get into databases, they think that databases are really complicated, and they're not. You know, there's only four, four commands with working with data. They're either select, update, insert, which is inserting a new record, or delete. There's just four commands. It's not that hard to learn. One of the reasons I was compelled to do this show is I think a lot of people, they look at databases from going from Excel to a database and they get sort of, there's a sort of terror that runs through them that, oh my God, I've got to learn this thing that's really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's just not so. No, um, but you know, you know what you know what it sounds like. It's like one of these things where years ago, maybe 20, 30 years yeah. ago, people were terrified of spreadsheets. Yes, you couldn't do a spreadsheet. <laughs> Make a formula on a spreadsheet? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Okay. But now, over that period of time, we have new generations. We have new requirements put on people in companies. Yeah. You know, you got to do this. This is part of the job. You know, and I suggest that, you know, although you got to say that spreadsheets are much more complex, more powerful, more sophisticated than they were, they even have macros that sound a lot like program language. Yes. But, but a relational database, that's where the action is. And so, maybe it won't be right now, but it'll be soon, 10 years maybe, everybody will have to know about these things, and the programs will get more powerful. And this brings me mm -hmm. to the competition for, for uh, DBase2, for Clipper, uh -huh. for ASP.NET, and ultimately for your, your precious access, your Microsoft Access program. Yeah. And what is that competition? There's two programs out there that are drag and drop. I've looked at both. One is QuickBase. Mm -hmm. QuickBase is, is, a, is a subsidiary of the Intuit company. Uh -huh. And uh, it's a drag and drop database. You can make relational tables and all that. And the other one is my favorite, the one I picked ultimately, <laughs> which is FileMaker. Okay, now tell me why those programs aren't the future. Well, I think they're, they, they just as well could be the future. Uh, just like I think um, access is, is used ubiquitously for people who understand and use de desktop databases. Now, the challenge that you have with any of these desktop database platforms is today we want things web enabled. So, you bet. Yeah. Now, QuickBase is a software as a service program. It lives on the web. Yeah. You don't have to have anything but a browser to use that program. It's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can't do that with Access. Actually, can. you can today. With uh, access? If you have a SharePoint server, you uh, can use Access. You have to have a server. You have to have a SharePoint in server. In the case of QuickBase, they have the server. Yes. You don't have to worry about that. That's right. All. It's, in, it's all in the cloud. Yeah. So, the, the beauty of, of course, when you're working with database applications where you have a dra drag and drop environment, it's very easy to get your data connected connected up and working. But now you have to be a little bit careful when you start working with databases because you can set up your hierarchies or your relationships incorrectly, which could create problems for you down the road. So it's always good if you have somebody that you can go to to have them take a look at your database design and see if it actually works consistent with your business model. Yeah, you got to look at what you're doing in the business. That's right. And it takes, it really does take some skill and some what do you call it, business perception, yeah. to walk into a, a business and figure out exactly what are they doing here? What, what, how does this table relate to that table? Mm -hmm. uh, this is not so easy. But, you know, I want to add this, that I have seen, I'm not using it, but I have seen programs that actually help you figure it out. And that's where this is all going. Programs that make the relations for you. Yes. 
approach. Yes. Well, there's, you know, when you work with relational databases and you're looking at your business model, it's really great to have somebody sit down with you who maybe understands um, databases because databases can go, you know, relational databases can also use hierarchical components. For example, and the, for example, you may have a table that is exclusive, like an animal table, and then there may be other tables that sort of are sort of higher up the food chain, such as a dog, a cat, a horse, and so on. Okay, so you can have hierarchical structures within a relational database, and sometimes those are important components to establish in your database uh, because it allows you to manage data more efficiently, especially when you start dealing with millions and millions of records. Um, well, and millions is no big deal now, right? Millions well, all these well, programs handle yeah. millions of records. It's yes. like, you know, a guy walks in and he says, oh, this is going to involve millions of records. You say, yeah, right, sure. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> well, the benefit of having computers that have more memory and more power, uh, are more, more powerful processors, that is that they can manage millions of records easily. Uh, the oh, yeah, instantly. Yeah. And the yes. search capability and the sort capability, mind-blowing yeah. on yeah. The current databases. They're much, they're much better. And so um, when you're going to work with databases, um, when, you're, when you're ready to, to get it started, the great thing is there are websites like lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com. A moment for a shout-out to lynda, L-Y-N-D-A.com. That is like, you know, software university. Anything you want to lo learn, you can learn uh -huh. on Linda. It's amazing. But it's not is. the only one. It's there not. are others, too. Yes. You know, and there was a time when it was only Linda. Uh -huh. and, and Linda was, and there is a Linda. There's a real person. Uh, um, there was a time when Linda was alone, and you couldn't find anybody even compar to compare. But now, there's a lot of people who emulate Linda. Yeah. Well, there's a company called Pluralsight, for example, which is because I'm a Microsoft uh, developer, and I developed in SQL Server, and and .NET, uh, uh, they're, a, they're a company that provides all kinds of training, and there's quite a bit of use, uh, stuff available too on YouTube. Now, um, so that people don't necessarily feel like they're, they're, they're going down a slippery slope here, learning databases um, is something that you can learn without having to learn all the other programming languages, because um, an, ac an access database, for example, will create the forms for you. Um, that you can use to enter in your data. Now, the thing is, when you start working with a database, you usually have an interface that does not look like a spreadsheet for entering in the information. You usually have some sort of a uh, form that has fields and drop-down controls, and most of us today have used web-based forms um, to enter in data, you know, whether it's a contact form, request information, or you're entering information for credit card processing or an e-commerce solution. And you get that with, with when you're working with a program like Access or FileMaker Pro. Yeah, or I mean, it's, it's, it's forms. Yes. You make a form, it has the fields on it, you fill in the fields, mm -hmm. that data goes into the table. Yes. And now you have um, some question you want to ask about what's, what's in that table right. uh, related to other tables. So you, now you have um, a, a, search, a search form, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or some way of generating a report. And so there's not a lot of you know, graphic images here. It's a form in, mm -hmm. it's uh, maybe a look at the table if you're curious how it, how it actually looks. It looks like a spreadsheet actually. Yeah. Okay. And then a form out. Yes. Um, so, it, you know, there's not that much to it. It's just that the relations are the, are the center more than, and the SQL commands right. to find things. Well, and also one of the great things about using forms uh, is, is let's, not, let's not forget that you have drop down lists that you pick from so you don't have to key all the information by hand. So exam for example, it easy wanted, for yeah, that's right, you don't have to pick a state, you know, a range of numbers, um, you know, something like that. So yeah, that or the validation techniques. Well, yes, you know, exactly. If you want to put a phone number in, it's got to be seven or ten digits. It can't be 27 digits. It's going to, it's going to argue and complain with you if you try that. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and, that, and that's, of course, again, goes back to having a platform that's more powerful than a spreadsheet because of the built-in error checking capability of the program when you're inputting the information. And you can make that as sophisticated or as simple as, as, as necessary. But the value of, of all of this is that we are moving away and we need to move away from just trying to use spreadsheets to solve data management in business. In yeah, business. And I remember the valuable thing about access anyway, my recollection of it is that mm -hmm. any Yonkel, if he put the, his mind on it, could develop an access program um, drag and drop, as I remember, it was a long time yes, ago, 20 yes, years yes, ago, yes, drag yes. and drop, uh, and, and do these reports and learn a lot about his business, and he could do it without a lot of equipment. 
Uh, all they needed was to download and otherwise have available the access. And, and I think the future, it's all going to be software as a service. It's all going to be because because the public doesn't want to be involved with servers or downloading. They want it right there. And I think all these companies are going to be migrating to software as a service. And that means, by the way, that it's on the web. Yeah. All you do is call up a browser, you know, and you're you're working. Um, that's what's going to happen, don't you think? And and as a result, it's hard for a given, um, say, employee of financial organization to say, I don't want to do it. It's too easy. Yeah. He's got to do it. Yeah, yeah. And here's the other th the other thing. Now, this is by putting things into a web or into a an environment where you have multiple users using your program uh, or contributing to a program is if one programmer or one person leaves, okay, that doesn't mean that all the programs that he might have developed while he while he was working there, um, you know, there's there's somebody else there who is familiar with what's already been developed. I've well, that's the that. problem in development. You yes. know, you've got to make it bulletproof. I, I'm sure this is a big part of your work. Yes. You've got to make it bulletproof so when one guy leaves, the other guy can just sit in his chair and it's going to be understandable. It's not going to break. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's going to be documented so he knows what it's doing. Um, this is really the challenge. And this is the value added you can provide. Yeah. Well, this is one of the, the problems I've had uh, historically coming into, for example, when I worked for the University of California in San Francisco, is there was somebody who had been working on, on programs privately by himself, writing code for eight years, and there was no documentation <laughs> oh, in the God. code. So I asked the guy, eight where's years your of Eight years oh, of code. God. I said, well, where's your documentation? He said, my code is my documentation. Oh, no, 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 that doesn't, no, that no, works. No, 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 no. <laughs> Well, it was job security for me for a while. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Yeah. And it would have been for him, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. So. Um, so one of the imperatives is if you're going to design a database that you, you were, you know, and here's one of the, 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 the key things about designing databases. It lets owners take back ownership of their company. Yes. Yeah. When people are doing things on spreadsheets and as an owner of a company, I don't know what they're doing, okay, and I don't understand what they're doing, I, so you sort of get hijacked. You know, that employee now sort of has you, right? She has yeah. you by the spreadsheet. Yes, she does. She has you by the spreadsheet. And so, you know, one of the great things about databases is that once you set up a database and it's something that's being used throughout the company, you sort of take back ownership of your business. So there's real value, too, in having databases that are designed to manage the process of your company. Yeah. Well, let me, let me add this, though, which I have found true in every circumstance, and that is when you get about the business of building a common a piece of software for a company, mm -hmm. whether it be a website that reaches into exactly what you do, um, I mean, in terms of function, in terms of your business function, right? Um, or building a database, which kind of looks at the same thing, but in much greater detail and much greater power, much greater capability for calculation. You know, yes, you are actually evaluating your company from a fresh point of view. You're rationalizing the thought that goes into what people do and the workflow and all that. And ultimately, when you build it, you are changing the company because now you have learned some stuff that you wind up reapplying back by, by developing the software. Well, you know, as somebody who developed software for 20 years for, for a variety of companies, is that um, it's interesting when you start to build out an application that there are people in the company that uh, will tell you that such and such a thing is true, and then in the management level, and then you go talk to the people who are doing the actual work, and they'll tell you it's not always true. And then you start to ferret out all the, the logic or the lack of logic or miscommunication that goes on within an organization. Yeah. So part of the work of a good programmer is to be an investigator. That is the and imperative. Go down and talk to people. That is the absolute. Find out, find out. And we are going to find out. We're going to find this out over time. We're going to learn so much about this. And we're going to share it with you, Chris and me. Chris Leatham, uh, the economy and you, big part of the economy as it should be uh, here on Think Tech. We'll be back soon. Uh, thanks for watching. Say say something nice. See you next week, folks, and uh, they won't. We'll stay uh, stay tuned for more on software. I knew we'd say that. Yeah. <laughs>